celebrate good times come on okay so maybe i don't have hope as a singer but there is a party going on over here at the second phase podcast we are celebrating that i reached eleven thousand unique downloads in the first year of the show our one year anniversary is january 6th and the 100th episode is just around the corner and will air on my birthday january 21st i love my birthday and I celebrate it all month. It's a big deal to me and I want to bring you along for the celebration and give you an opportunity to win a gift from me. So join the giveaway today. I am giving one lucky winner a brand assessment coaching session with me to start 2021 off with clarity and confidence with your brand messaging to attract more clients for more profits and to create a bigger impact on the world to serve the people that you're called to serve in a big way. To enter, all you have to do is leave a rating and review on the show. Screenshot the review and share it in your Instagram or Facebook stories. Be sure to tag me to be entered. Just tag at the Robin Graham. You can enter today, January 4th through January 8th. The winner will be announced in the Female Entrepreneur Insider Facebook group on January 11th during the Attract More Clients Accelerator Workshop which is only a week away. For a bonus entry, invite a friend to join the Female Entrepreneur Insider Facebook group for the Attract More Clients Accelerator Masterclass happening January 11th to the 13th. Mark your calendars today. You've heard me talk about the workshop in previous episodes, but here's the nuts and bolts of it. In the workshop, we will create a roadmap for brand success, starting with an inventory of your brand messaging online walking through how to go from crickets to traction to kickstart your brand and business and go from stuck to unstoppable in 2021. I absolutely love surprises and gifts and can't wait to see who wins the giveaway. And I can't wait to work with that person. But more importantly, I can't wait to see how your brands blossom after the masterclass. Thank you all for being here, and I can't wait to see the reviews and the ratings and see who wins. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Second Phase Podcast. I'm Robin Graham, your host, and a brand marketing strategist and photographer passionate about helping women connect and grow their audience and get more clients. I am so excited you are here with me today to chat all about branding, personal development, and life overall in this second phase. What is the second phase? The second phase for me was a change in careers and learning how to navigate a new world and build the business from the ground up when I was actually terrified to put myself out into the world as something new. For some, the second phase is a significant lifestyle change, a traumatic loss, a move, an illness. It could be any number of things. No matter the definition of your second phase, we are here together to learn about creating a brand that stands out and makes an impact and grow as our authentic selves and follow our callings, our passions, our visions, and our values. Now grab your cup of coffee or the dog's leash and let's dive into a new episode. Hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Second Phase Podcast. I believe we are on episode number 96 today, which blows my mind. It's a very special guest today. Charlie Grosso is a photographer, actually. She was an advertising photographer, journalist, and had some really great experiences and identified a need that there needed to be an increase in digital literacy in refugee populations. And she set out with her curiosity and she has built a nonprofit that is making great strides in helping and educating refugee populations and communities to be able to use digital services, digital products, digital skills to create better lives. Her journey has been incredible, but I think you're going to find this interview really enlightening. And at the end of the day, we'll be talking about, you know, how to push fear aside from thinking that if we're in a place of security, we have to stay there and that the journey we're on is our forever journey. I've been talking a lot about this, about, you know, job security, about 
finding your second phase and pivoting and all of these things in recent episodes. And I think this one really kind of solidifies all those concepts that I've been talking about. But we're going to really dive into how we can take our unique skill sets and that they will lead us to success and maybe not on the journey that we thought we were going to be on forever. And that is okay. It's actually a blessing to be able to take a deep dive into our, you know, curiosity and our values and our visions and our passions and create something new and move forward and away from those things that, um, were maybe holding us back, weren't as meaningful, weren't fulfilling, and weren't having the impact that we're actually called to have. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Charlie has a really like just relaxing, smooth voice. You know, you're, I think you're going to feel like you're just sitting having coffee with her. So um, thanks for being here today. If you enjoy the episode, I would be forever grateful if you would head on over to iTunes and leave a rating and review that will help us get this episode out into more hands, ears, eyes to learn more about Charlie's nonprofit and help the future and build communities around the world. Thanks for being here. Charlie Grosso, welcome to the Second Phase Podcast. Thank you for having me, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here. I am very excited to introduce you to my audience. So you're doing some phenomenal work and it's your work now is in an area that most of us here in the States probably haven't thought a lot about and haven't thought a lot about serving this population. And I think it's going to be really remarkable to have this conversation with you, not to mention the fact that we both have this common thread of photography, totally different elements of photography, but we have that. And I think whenever people have some sort of root connection in terms of life experiences, being work or relationships or whatever, the conversations just flow naturally. So I think this is going to be really fun. So with all of that said, I would love to have you tell the listeners a little bit about you, your journey from your first phase as a photographer to where you are now in this impactful work that you're doing. Uh, Thank you, Robin. So I started my career when I was 20 years old as a photographer. I got my first advertising job as 22. Before that, I guess I was honing my craft and just testing my sea legs out doing headshots for my fellow college classmates. I went to University of Southern California majoring in theater. So there was kind of this built in audience for, for me to test this business idea that I essentially had or this passion I had that I was like, oh, maybe I can turn it into a livelihood. I spent my 20s being an advertising photographer in Los Angeles, fashion, celebrity, luxury goods, and then a creator director. That kind of wrapped itself up in 2008. A little bit of force majeure, market crashed, and there was no work for advertising photographers. And I was doing a lot of documentary work prior to 2008, just as a thing for myself. I did this long-term documentary project about food markets across the world. The project started in probably 2004. Like a minute before the omnivore dilemma kind of came out and before we kind of talked about food as a national conversation, right? And you've only seen that trend go upwards, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I did that market project, that long-term documentary photography project for probably 14 years. I covered 42 countries and 120 cities. That was meant to be a book. So that work to carry me through post 2008. So 2008 market crashes. I was out of work as an advertising photographer and the creative director. And I just kind of picked that up full time. And then I moved to New York City, started a contemporary art gallery with a friend. We had the contemporary art gallery for about five years. So I got a view of the art world because I think the question at the time was now that I'm done with the quote unquote commercial aspect of photography, what does the fine art component of it look like? Right. That's a transition or or a field in which a lot of like very established contemporary photographers try to transition into. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So once we we're done with the art gallery in 2015, I was looking around to see what I wanted to do next. And instead of putting out a framework of like, oh, I want to be an interior designer or I want to write a cookbook, I ended up setting out a list of criteria of things that the next phase, if you will, uh, as you do, Mm -hmm. needed to involve. I wanted to work internationally. I wanted to use my various 
you know, diverse set of skills now I have honed for the last 15 years. I wanted to be of positive impact. And I was really interested in how can I help other people tell their stories. There's a view that I feel. So in journalism, we always say that we're, you know, bearing witness, right? We're bearing witness to X, Y, and Z, which I think is super important. And that we want to amplify untold voices, which I think is super important. But I wonder if that doesn't go far enough, right? Because there's no true objectivity as a creator, right? No matter what kind of creator you are, as a journalist, as a photographer, and then that being compounded by the natural inclination of the media outfit that is picking up your pieces, right? And then there's the hand of the editor. So I think there's so many layers removed from that original story and from the person whose Mm -hmm. story you felt compelled to witness and to amplify, right? And I also wonder if that sense of empowerment that is supposed to come from the witnessing and the amplification is just so reduced, if you will, because, again, it's so deeply mediated. Right. So then the question becomes, Mm -hmm. yeah, how can we kind of eliminate some of the levels in between and really return that power to the original story owner? I love that. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had Yvette Walker on and she's a former journalist and she went into the details of this because we talked a little bit about journalism ethics and we talked about the bias and how, you know, you as a journalist can create a story, but that doesn't mean it's going to be told by the host of a show or the news anchor, the way that you saw the story as the journalist and the way that the story was told to you or shared with you. So I think it's fascinating that you're saying all of this because since that interview, and I mean, really in the past, what, five, 10 years when, you know, the media has had so much more of a slant on the decisions that we're making or an influence on the decisions we're making and, and our opinions and everything else. It's really interesting to see those layers kind of being peeled back. So I'm glad you're speaking to this. So, you know, and being 42, having grown up with the internet, right, in a very kind of, there was a life before internet, right, and then there's a life after internet mm-hmm. way. Um, I still believe in in the in that initial promise, right? That seems a we've forgotten it by now, and b deeply perverted, right? That the internet is the biggest democratizing forces of all, and so then that became well then what we're really talking about is a set of skills, right? Because what I have is a set of skills. A set of skills as a storyteller, whether it be in written words or or performative or documentary or photography or, you know, any kind of visual, like it's a set of skills. That's a set of skills that can be taught. So these were kind of the things I was interested in. These were the checklists, if you will, like the next phase needed to include. Robin, never did I think it was going to be an educational nonprofit. (laughs) That was just not the framework I had in my head. But that was what it came out to be, right? Because once I started investigating the refugee crisis and I moved abroad for about a year, I lived in Istanbul just to get a little bit closer to talk to families and and communities and to really understand what the community needs are. The boxes was starting to get checked one by one. And the, you know, the formulation of Hello Future, my nonprofit, and the work that we do checks all those boxes that I set out, you know, in the beginning, right? So And it became this container that held it all, which I could have never imagined in the first place. It was a really interesting way to kind of backwards mapping to it, if you will, in some regard Mm -hmm. to this next phase. Yeah. You know, it's something that I say all the time. It's really important for us to align our core values to whatever we're doing. And so to look at and, you know, I use it when I'm coaching with you know, how to really find your niche or find that next phase, what it is that you're meant to be doing. And when we align our values, our visions and our passions, which is exactly what you did, and then incorporate into that our skill sets, it becomes very, I think, powerful to unfold what it is we're meant to be doing. You can find it when you really look at and try to align those things. So let's talk a second about, so you basically left New York, you left any security you knew, and you moved abroad to start this project. So there had to have been money involved, like were you and there had to have been fear involved to give up the security, something that you knew a place you were comfortable with and had a steady income to pick up and move to discover, can I make this project become a reality? And then how did you, first of all, overcome that fear? But second of all, 
what about money? Like, how did you make this so that it could become a business for you? Yes, it's a nonprofit, but how does it become a livelihood for you? Uh, well, Hello Future currently is not my livelihood. I <laughs> <laughs> I opted to not pay myself in these last five years because I wanted to prove that our thesis is true, right? That our programs work. So every dollar we raise has gone back out into the field in testing our program and iterating our program and paying our staff. I have basically been a career freelancer for 22 years. I've never been somebody else's employee. I've always been on my own payroll. I think the fear and uncertainty, I wrote it out in the first 10 years, if you will, and got used to it, you know, got used to the good times are good and the bad times are bad, right? And you you kind of plan for those outcomes. I think the easiest answer is that, like, find a job of adjacency, right? Find some way in which you can revenue generate, even if it's not in that direct thing that you want to do, but in adjacent to, right? So I still have a little photography business on the side that I do that, you know, covers my bills. I also don't live in a extravagant lifestyle, you know, which I think is so in alignment with the work you're doing. So let's talk a little bit about Hello Future, because I think it's really important for the listeners to understand exactly what it is you're doing for this popu- for the refugee population. And I want to know, too, as you start to talk about what you're doing, I want to know how you discovered that this population was the population you wanted to work with? So I was really fascinated with the Arab Spring 10 years ago. And when the protests abrupted in Tahir Square in Egypt, I was riveted. I couldn't take my eyes off of the thing. And I had been in Egypt a month prior. And when I saw the news break on CNN, my first instinct was I wanted to be back there. I wanted to cover it as a foreign correspondent. I was 32 at the time. I did not work for a major media. I was like, well, I have enough skills. I can probably get a job as a stringer if I wanted to. And I was like, yeah, but I'm 32. Getting paid $250 a week doesn't sound like a great idea. And I'm 32 and I no longer think getting shot at is a good idea. I think it would have been different if I was 25, right? Or 22, where you're just young enough to believe that you're indestructible. Right. So I sat that out. I was like, well, I think my foreign correspondence window might have passed me. Then I was deeply fascinated with the Middle East. And, you know, and I've been in and out of there at various times as I was working on my uh, food market project. So then when 2015 came and we wrapped up the art gallery, the Syrian refugee crisis was kind of hitting this really high crescendo. So I was like, well, let's go check it out. You know, the instinct was to get closer to understand it better. And I really wanted to kind of immerse myself in it in in whatever way that was kind of feasible. So Istanbul seemed like a good place to become home base. I have friends out there. So I moved out there. And then I started just to speak with, you know, people in the community. Right. A common fact not a lot of people are aware of is that 60 percent of refugees live in communities and only 40 percent live in refugee camps. So I started speaking with families that were living in communities and just and then I was also really curious about their relationship to the Internet. What is that relationship? Do they have a mobile phone? If so, what do they do with it? Because I was seeing reports where the U.N. estimated that they pay upwards of 20 percent of their limited income on connectivity and also reported that said that, you know, they left with nothing but the clothes on their back and the phone in their pockets. Right. So all of the indicator told me that it was important to them. So the question is, like, what did you do with it? So every household had at least one mobile, whether it's a, you know, a smartphone or like a basic dial up phone. That's just a socioeconomics thing. And the answer was overwhelmingly the same. They were on Facebook, they were on Instagram, they were on WhatsApp. It was the principal communication tool for them to both receive news from abroad, from home, just to know what's going on and to stay in touch with their families. The curious thing is that those three platforms were their entire view of the internet. Nothing else, just those three things, right? So they lived in this like kind of siloed garden, if you will. It's like back in 1985 when you only had three TV channels to watch. Yeah. Right. Instead of the unlimited choices that exist today. And the families always always wanted to talk to me about their children's education and how concerned they are. And I would ask them, I was like, have you ever thought about looking for like, you know, games and videos that can help your kids learn online? And again, the answer was really uniform. They're like, what? They've never performed a Google search. It never occurred to them to perform a Google search. And that's when I realized you don't know what you don't know. 
right? If you weren't habituated with the idea that the internet holds everything you could possibly want to know, all you had to do is look for it, you wouldn't know to go look for it, right? Yeah. So, and this extended to the teenagers as well, this kind of digital illiteracy, if you will. And, uh, you know, a 15 year old kid asking me, like, how do you Google? I'm like, what do you mean you don't understand how to Google? They're like, I don't know how to Google. But these are not illiterate teenagers, right? Like, they've had a good education in Syria. Syria's literacy rate, traditional literacy rate, was 86% before the war. Wow. United States is 86%. Right, right. Right. So you're not talking about a place where the population itself was uneducated. Right. Yeah. You've got an educated population. You would think they would know these simple things that we use every single day and take for granted. 100%. And then it extended to things like email, right? Most people didn't have email or didn't know how to use email. Most people didn't understand how to, you know, do Microsoft Word or Google Doc, you know, as it has this current form. Right. And I remember, you know, my first job or, you know, part time jobs like you would put on your application like skills, Microsoft Word, right, Excel, yeah, PowerPoint. Yeah. Those are hireable skills and they still are. They're the difference between, you know, entry level office work and inconsistent manual labor. Right. So it's just a lot of these basic digital skills that we take for granted that they did not know. And then they most certainly did not have the digital literacy, the ability to find, share and uh, create content online that we presume. But, you know, not only is having the skill and not having the skill, the difference between different kinds of livelihood one can make for itself. But there's also a lot of protection issues. Right. In the U.S., we talk about all the fake news. Right. All the misinformation that is floating around, whether it be about election, whether it be about vaccine, whether it be about covid, the risk for those things only multiplies for vulnerable populations such as the refugees. Right. Mm -hmm. So once I kind of made this discovery of the need for digital literacy and the lack thereof, again, I was like, oh, well, that's a skill I can teach. So that was how Hello Future was founded. It was it was founded on discovering this particular niche of needs. And then we decided to work with teenagers because they're the easiest vector for scale. They can teach up to their parents. They can teach down to their siblings. And also, surprisingly, there's the least amount of programs available for them as for whatever reason. Right. The bigger outfits, the UNSFs and the Save the Children, they tend to program for K through four. And then different agency steps in once they're 18 plus to do some version of livelihood training. But the teenagers, 14 through 18, they're very much so kind of just don't have a lot of options in terms of additional formal or informal educational opportunities. But the girls are very much so at risk to early marriage and the boys are at risk for radicalization. So that's how the work kind of formed itself, both from the things we wanted to teach to the age group that we wanted to teach it to. And then we piloted in 2017. I came home from Istanbul um, at the end of 2016, did my 501c3 and raised a little bit of money and went back out in 2017 and created our first pilot in a refugee camp in Iraqi Kurdistan. And 2018 was spent in iteration and raising more money. And then we've been in the field consistently since 2019. So do you have volunteers in the field working for you? And are they teaching in the classroom? Or do you have paid employees that are meeting with individuals and communities? How is the program structured? So our program is structured to be in-person in person programs. Pre-COVID was a classroom of 25 led by a lead instructor and three or four teaching assistants. These are all pay positions. Having essentially been a freelancer my entire career, I believe in paying people for their labor and for their work. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it gives us as a measure of accountability, right? Yes, that accountability is key. And given that I wasn't going to live in Kurdistan full time to oversee the program, I wasn't going to move there, right? I needed to make sure that there was both accountability and responsibility between me and my staff. So we teach in person. The students who enter our digital basic digital literacy course gets a mobile phone when they come into the class. So like a hundred twenty five dollars worth of phone, basically nothing fancy. Right. Nobody's getting a new iPhone. Mm -hmm. And all the teaching is kind of predicated around like the that particular tool. Right. So instead of a laptop or a, an iPad or mobile phone is a device. And when they meet all the graduation metrics, they get to keep that mobile phone. So we add an asset to the family. 
So for that reason, we attract a lot of girl students because, you know, girls are always in line for resources, right? Mm-hmm. That's just the culture and that's just where we are. So we attract a lot of girl students. I would say our program is somewhere between 75 to 85% girls. We have a 100% retention rate. And this is interesting because this is a population where girls have not traditionally had opportunity. So are the girls seeing this as an opportunity and a way to enhance their future? Like, is that why they're they're coming in? Or are their parents saying, get in there and get this and help us all get out? What are the dynamics there? Because it's such an, you know, it's for so many years, women's voices in those countries have been stifled. I think it's a little bit of, you know, A and a little bit of B. I think the carrot is the device. Right. I think in the beginning days, you know, in like 2017, 2019, they weren't really sure like what we're trying to teach them. Even now, the having to explain digital literacy to a potential funder who are not familiar with it, it's a it's a five minute, you know, explanation. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a lot of existing biases that I have to overcome. So I don't think the kids knew exactly what was happening, like what they're expected to learn. In 2018, when we post pilot and we took all of our learnings and reiterated, we realized that a lot of what the kids need in addition to hard skills, right, email, uh, Google search, search and verification, docs and sheets and PowerPoint, is that they need development in the soft skills, in their ability to be analytical and critical thinking and group work and empowerment and self-expression. So that's why we took a year to reiterate our curriculum. So the program we have currently in the field touches on all those things. Do you have success stories to date? Like has any of the students graduated and what are they doing? Like, are they using these skill sets, both soft skills and technical skills, digital skills? Are they using them to enhance their future, enhance their livelihood, impact their families? So two of our students have secured a full scholarship to universities, which is fantastic. So our program has expanded since 2019, especially in this COVID year. We've actually been in a growth phase, surprisingly. So in one of the activities that we expanded to in 2020, they have put the skills we taught them in ways to benefit their own community. In April, when, you know, COVID was kind of ramping up, our graduates found that There was a shortage of goods, groceries and like basic daily supplies in their camp. And the shortage was being really stressful, of course, to all the community members. It wasn't because it was an actual shortage of supplies. It was because they're 200 kilometers from the Iranian border. So a lot of their goods came from Iran. And Iran was having a real huge flare up of COVID cases. But due to the lack of information and the lack of education, the community and the camp residents thought that the COVID virus lived on packages and goods that shipped across the border. So they're not buying goods that came from Iran in fear of being contaminated. So our students, you know, created a series of educational flyers and like, you know, put it all over the camp to just let the community know, right? They did their own public service announcement, if you will. Right. Well, it, almost an educational campaign. Absolutely. And in our latest event in November, another team, we were talking about what are the challenges to remote learning to the students. And one of them is they don't have textbooks. For whatever reason, the official formal education ministry is not distributing textbooks. So it's really difficult for the kids to learn. In addition to the lack of hardware, the some families don't have internet access or the internet access is really poor. So all the learnings is becoming really challenged for them. And these girls, Layla and Nada and a few others, thought that they should just go collect used textbooks from the kids that have already completed those grades, scan them, and then put them up on Google Drive for all the kids to share. Right. So this is a demonstration of digital literacy and in problem solving Mm -hmm. and then in how they can benefit their community. And these girls are 17 years old. Yeah, that's fabulous. So when you talk about digital literacy, you're talking about just that ability to find, share and create content online. Is it that simple or is there more depth to it? That's the most basic definition of digital literacy, right? That's like the commonly agreed on and it's like most fundamental form. 
I think digital literacy is more complex than that if you break down each of the individual aspects of it, right? Find, share, create. 80% of the internet is media. So I think actual digital literacy should include media literacy because that's where privacy and vulnerability stems from, if you will, right? That's a trigger point, right? And media literacy is complex. We don't look at the two things in the same breath, right? We think a teenager who can create a TikTok video can understand if the article that got shared with him is real or not, right? He or she can do some version of like source verification, right? Those are two different skills, but we can found them to be the same, right? Especially here in the U.S. The other thing I think that gets confounded too is hardware proficiency. Just because I can figure out how to get you to the settings in your phone quicker than you can doesn't mean that I have the critical capacity, if you will, right, to understand all the different vulnerabilities and challenges that comes with this essentially open platform where anyone Mm -hmm. can create anything. Yeah, deciphering what's real versus not real. Yeah. Which, you know, we're, we all struggle with that in this world. It's something that, you know, even as adults, it's like, well, is, and there are so many things that people are creating that are meant to be funny, but you first take a look at them and it, and you think, oh my gosh, this cannot possibly be real, but it must be real because somebody circulated it. And so you really do have to dive deep into your own psyche to analyze things before you believe them. It didn't used to be that way. You know, you you took what was in print for absolutely truth and fact, and now we can't do that. So I can see where this would be an even greater challenge for someone who hasn't grown up with these tools and, and having to decipher these things on a regular basis. Okay, so let's change gears for just a couple seconds. So, okay, let's face it. 2020 has been, you know, this unprecedented year. And I'm so glad that we're almost to 2021 and we can quit talking about 2020 because <laughs> I think that, yes, there have been bad things. There have been struggles. There have been obstacles. But at the end all be all, it, there have been a lot of blessings too. And, you know, there's a there are a lot of people out there doing incredible work, just like you're doing. If someone say in 2020 lost their job or in 2020 realized, you know what? I'm living a life that I am not fulfilled in and I don't want to stay in this. I want to do something different. I want to do something meaningful. I want to have an impact. What are the like first three to five things that you would tell them that they would need to do to start an initiative like what you've done with Hello Future? I think if we're talking about being at an inflection point and wanting to chase something that's just more fulfilling altogether, I would say one of the most liberating thing for me is to divorce my sense of identity from what I do. For a really long time, like who I am was that I'm an advertising photographer. You know, who I am was I was a documentary photographer. Who I am was an art gallery director here in New York City. Right, I own an art gallery. I dress the part. I look the part. Like the things, you know what I'm saying? We presented that brand image, if you will. Yeah. Right. I think it can be a straitjacket at some point, right? And we've heard this from other influencers and like, you know, people who really bank on their brand, right? I can't say this because it's not within Brand Alliance. I can't do that because it's not good for my brand, right? It's a straitjacket that doesn't allow us to experiment. You know, I've been in sessions with people where they're like, what's your blue sky scenario? Is it that Hello Future is an organization with, you know, $5 million in revenue by X year or that you have impacted, you know, X many lives or that as uh, Scott Harrison says, for charity water, he wants to eradicate the water crisis, right? He wants to make sure everybody has safe drinking water worldwide, right? I think those big audacious statements are so alluring, right? I fall for them all the time. I think they're great marketing speak, I'm like, yes, that's a great idea. But for me personally, they have always felt like a hollow metrics. The question I ask myself these days is, what is my ideal day and what can I do to have as many of those as possible? I'm looking to be free. It doesn't mean that I don't want to work because I really do enjoy working, but I want to feel like I'm in charge of my day. I'm in charge of my time. And I don't think I need to have an X net worth, if you will, in order to create those days. I don't think my organization needs to be at an X size 
you know, judged by revenue and donations in order to create those days. Five years in, I know without a doubt that Hello Future is making an impact on the ground. I see it in our kids all the time. The girls are more confident. They're more empowered. They feel like they can go for things that they want. And we're teaching them actual skills that they need in order to achieve those dreams, right? Not just like a feel good empowerment overallness, right? It's underwritten by a lot of hard skills. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool, right? I know that in nonprofit work, funders like to measure impact as in, you know, the the beneficiaries were on this particular trajectory and you, the nonprofit, entered at X point and thereby their trajectory changed for good. Mm -hmm. It's a silver bullet solution. It's a very linear progress line in how we look at outcome. I understand why that's alluring too, but I think that ignores the complexity in which life exists in. I love to say that their lives will ultimately be made better. I can say in the short term of what we see in them, they absolutely do. But how their outcomes will fare in 30 years, I don't know. I also never thought I would be in the nonprofit business either. Right. Yeah, you make a good point. I mean, it's really hard to speculate almost. Like you can set goals, but there are so many human, I guess, situations or experiences that can shift and alter the trajectory. So you can't necessarily put that into play every single time. Okay. So if they are a person who has done all these things and they've been working for all these years and they were starting to feel as though their purpose was expiring in that realm and they have the financial backing to be able to shift and do something, you know, to follow their passion or to align with what they feel would be more meaningful. I think you've given a good set of I guess, comments slash, you know, your criteria that can influence someone to look at something like, okay, well, what is my end goal? What would be important for me to produce at the end of this journey? How can I impact lives so that we can see either their trajectory change or an impact in quality of life or opportunity? So I think those are really, really great things to look at. And then as far as the actual action items that you would take, so you came back from your trip after exploring this, obviously you had to research, you had to do a lot of soul diving, you know, deep diving into yourself to see what was going to be the right fit for you and where your skill sets were the most needed, which I think is very important too. What population can you impact? And then you came back, you set up the 501c3, which that makes it legit. <laughs> that's, you know, that's the only way you can actually make yeah. raise money, right? And then from there, you, I'm guessing you sought out your team. Uh, yeah, we didn't look for in-country staff until 2017 when we went back for our pilot. But, you know, we started consulting experts on what curriculum design looks like, what a good curriculum would be, right? Because that was, that was kind of the first task, right? I had to go make the thing before we can go teach the thing. I think for listeners who are struggling to figure out what their next phase is, I think the question to ask yourself is like, what am I curious about, right? Can I set up that next phase so that not only am I doing good, but I'm learning something too? I don't think we put this idea of learning as front and center as perhaps we should in our search for that second phase, right? I think again, Mm -hmm. It can be underwritten by a lot of hollow metrics. I want to be an influencer. I want to have X many followers. I want to make X million dollars, right? I'm not saying that they're not worthwhile goals, but I also think we've heard a lot of interviews from very accomplished people who have achieved those things and found that it did not provide as much meaning as they hoped it would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And I think that sense of curiosity goes, well, and I think we could even say curiosity is a value. It's a core value. Where does that fit into play with your entire life? And I think you and I are both very curious people. I think that creative side of us lends us to be probably more curious than others sometimes. Yeah. It is fascinating, but I think that's a really important statement is to be curious because there's so many opportunities out there. And especially, I think, you know, we talked a tiny bit about, you know, that fear of moving from a place of security to finding and identifying that new thing. And you're not going to find anything if you're not willing to let the fear subside and, or push the fear aside and then put that curiosity into play. 
So I think that's really important. And I love how you said that it's been very liberating to divorce your sense of identity. And I think so many times we have this vision of ourselves and, you know, other people have this vision of us and it's really hard to break free from that. So I love that we've had this conversation because I love the work you're doing. I think it's so important to educate other populations and other communities and grow that sense of worldly community. And you're doing that through Hello Future. And I think it's a huge blessing to them that they're now going to have opportunities they wouldn't have had previously. We could talk for hours and hours and hours as to, you know, how you landed in the actual physical place and community that you landed in and how, you know, uh, the each individual student is doing and their families. We could talk forever because I have so many questions. It's like curiosity in me, but we do have to wrap up. So what I would love to do is have you just leave the listeners with ways that they can help you impact the youth of other countries and help them become more digitally literate and what we can do to support you as well as how can they find you and and learn more about your organization and tap into, you know, your brilliance and, and what you're doing. Thank you, Robin. You can find more about our work at Hello Future at um, hellofuture.io. Donations are always welcome since we are a nonprofit organization and our entire work is supported by generous donors and, um, and listeners like you. We're structuring out various lightweight mentorship opportunities as well for people who want to be a little bit more involved. The information is forthcoming, but you can always drop me a line at charlie at hellofuture.io. I can write you back and tell you a little bit more in detail. You can find more about myself and my work at charliegrosso.com, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-G-R-O-S-S-O.com. And I'm launching an experiment in January, most likely. It's called High Love, and it's a platonic love letter. There's lots of thinking that went behind it. It'll be a fun experiment, and I hope you'll join me on that journey as well. You can find out more about that on my site. And uh, yeah. Excellent. I am really excited about your project with the platonic love. I was reading about that. I think it's such a cool idea, such a cool idea. Okay. So one last question, and this is going to be kind of a whammy, but well, first of all, is there a language barrier? Like if people want to mentor, like when you said, you know, you're going to do those soft mentorship opportunities, is there a language barrier? Do people need to fear that? Or is it something that is already accommodated for? We accommodate for that with translators. So Perfect. there's always translators involved. So you do not need to speak Arabic or Kurdish in order to um, participate. Okay, awesome. And why should the listeners support you over another organization? There's lots of people doing lots of great work. I think what COVID has done is shown us without a doubt, if you were ever in doubt before, that we're all connected. Our fortunes are deeply tied to each other's, even to those who we never, ever see and get to meet. I have not ever brought in someone to do mentorship for us in 2020 who were not profoundly excited and changed by their interaction with our students. And it really is great to see it, to meet them and see them. And, and you know, a lot of the judges have children, so they bring their children kind of into the fold here and there, too. And it's a great opportunity for um, for the mentors to expose their kids to a different reality, to grow that empathy muscle, right, to grow that curiosity muscle. Oh, I love it. And there's nothing better than learning about other cultures. Absolutely. Oh, thanks so much, Charlie. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed the show. Now, don't forget to join the giveaway. All you have to do is leave a rating and review. Screenshot the rating and review and put it in your Facebook and Instagram stories on either platform and tag me. If you want a bonus entry, invite another entrepreneur who is motivated and inspired to create a strong foundation for their brand and business to join the Attract More Clients Accelerator Masterclass happening January 11th to 13th in the Female Entrepreneur Insider Facebook group. If you've never left a rating and review before, here's how you do it. The link to leave a rating and review will be in the show notes if you need some help. You scroll all the way down past the episodes and then you click the star for the rating. Then you click submit a review. After clicking submit a review, you write your review. Then you hit submit and done. That's it. It's so easy. It's just sometimes hard to find where you leave the rating and review, but now you know. And that's a wrap, friends. Thank you so much for listening today. 
I am grateful to have you here with me. If you enjoyed this episode and found the information helpful, will you please take a moment to subscribe and leave a rating and review? That would mean the world to me. It will also help others find the podcast. I really look forward to getting to know my listeners. Will you please connect with me on Instagram? You can find me at the Robin Graham. You can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn as Robin Graham. And I invite you to join my private Facebook group, The Brand Marketing Insider. Please spread the word about the second phase podcast. Until next time, remember to smile.